Welcome back to another episode of Aboutcast. Hey everybody, it is the man of your dreams and your earbuds and your earphones for the moment being, Jordan. And today I found, you know, I think that the way that things go, especially with how we research on this, um, you know, on Aboutcast, you, uh, every once in a while, you kind of find episodes like this. And the reason why this is peculiar is because this is kind of one of those weird byproducts of research where you find something that is perplexing, interesting, and to be fair, maybe a little bit of a reach um, as far as kind of connecting the dots, but I think is so meaningful and uh, has enough to, you know, warrant kind of traveling down this rabbit hole. And um, please once, um, number one, uh, please give me the patience of kind of giving this a prelude before we actually get into anything. But essentially what I'm talking about is I was planning on doing an episode on the evolutionary cycle of the scientist to the artist. And that has to do with a lot of different fields. Uh, I was doing research on um, a, cer- a certain jujitsu player. And um, for those of you who know me, um, I I do love jujitsu. Uh, I've been doing it for a while now, uh, going on a year, uh, minus the, um, you know, probably the eight to six months that we've been in lockdown. But um, I, I was listening to a podcast on one of the kind of the leaders in it, especially with uh, heel hooks um, in the 50-50, Ryan Hall. And he kind of uh, spawned this idea of um, how, you know, in any skill set, in any degree, we start as scientists with measurable facts and information to construct our world. And then once we get really, really good, sometimes some, some of us actually become artists. And what an artist does that a scientist doesn't is he takes those facts or distorted rules, theories, and laws um, and distorts them. And essentially, kind of his whole being or presence of uh, modus operandi, if you will, is to manipulate the things that he based his reality on beforehand. And essentially, you know, I was looking up research as far as like people who, you know, had this cycle. Maybe there's somebody who's like done the reverse. And I found um, two very, very interesting people that had had overlapping um, childhoods and a few eerily similar things that I'll just list off here. Um, and then I'll, I'll let the cat out of the bag. But essentially, these guys were both uh, legends in their field, quite prodigious when they were young, as far as their skill set, too, um, were extraordinarily religious at one point in their lives, at least. Um, they had the same birthday within two days of each other and both died within six months of each other at the ages of 40 and 39. And the thing that really ties this all together and, um, gives you the episode title of the kind of the Machiavellian imprint is they both had this really interesting experience when they were young of actually being intentionally held back from the craft that they actually excelled at. So, um, without further ado, essentially I'm talking about Blaise Pascal and Pistol Pete Maravich. And I know for, all right, so number one, if I'm, if this is too much of a reach, first off, just hear me out, listen to the first little bit of both podcasts, um, because I'll be doing separate ones, but, uh, definitely linking them through and talking about their childhood a little bit more and each of them. But I think that there is enough to kind of explore, like I said before. And if not, um, reach out to us and say, hey, bro, uh, Julian needs to get back on this. Uh, Jordan has gotten way too weird, way too quick. So uh, without further ado, the the whole episode idea is I'm going to be stepping through Pistol Pete, who, for those of you know, is a basketball legend. And then the next episode, I'll be stepping through Blaise Pascal, who was the famous mathematician and philosopher, and trying to bridge the gap, because I know there's a lot of difference between, well, one person that was born in the 
1940s and then one person that was born in the 1640s or 1600s so um there's there's a lot of difference in interplay and that's obviously separated by about 400 or so years so there's a lot of things there that i'm reaching and bridging across but i think that the kind of the way that they actually grew up um says a little bit of how they actually became as people and it's also kind of weird how they had such other similarities as far as you know their you know they also at one point they both lost their mothers um and things of that nature as well so anyway without further ado we're stepping into pistol pete maravich so to start off um for those of you who don't know, I'm going to give a brief synopsis of what Pistol Pete is about. He is a legendary basketball player. And full disclosure, one of my favorite basketball players ever. Um, I think personally, um, and it's very arguably so, one of the best um, scorers that college basketball has ever seen, um, ever. And um, I po- I personally think that it's not even close, especially with, uh, you know, the things that he was doing. He did it in three years, you know, three-point line, but we'll get more into that later. Um, he averaged about 24 points per game throughout his 10-year career in the NBA. And he had played for three teams, the Atlanta Hawks, the, at the time, it's the New Orleans, New Orleans Jazz, and then ended up at the Boston in Boston at the Boston Celtics facility or an organization to finish up his career. But the main thing about Pistol Pete is that he was a prolific, um, and I believe, you know, it's very fair to call him kind of a virtuoso of the game when it came to the things that he did. And if you interview or think about, you know, the interviews of the greats that we consider greats as basketball people. So we're talking about like Steve Nash, um, especially in the point guard era, uh, I do believe he's even had, um, you know, people have stolen his DNA as far as like Magic Johnson and things of that nature as well. I mean, it's so clear to see when you overlay games. But the thing that I really um, think about sometimes is that when Steve Nash was being interviewed, he was talking about how Pistol Pete, um, you know, he studied him as a point guard, how he was doing things that, you know, at the time, in the 2000s that Nash was doing now or things are happening now. Um, So it just shows you how ahead of his time he was and um, how, you know, I think that that science to artistry thing uh, is, you know, whole totally stands clear with Pistol Pete in in a lot of ways. But without further ado, um, stepping through his childhood, which is kind of the juicier part for this uh, two-part series um, for the Machiavellian imprint, uh, Pistol Pete was born to a Helen and Peter Press Maravich. So he was Peter Jr., um, but everybody called his dad Press, and that was for uh, way back in the day he used to sell uh, newspapers. And his father was the son of immigrants that came over from the uh, Eastern Europe. And essentially, the, about... You know, a couple of years before or a year or so before Pete was, and I guess we'll call him Pistol Pete from now on, um, just to avoid confusion. Pete was about seven. Pistol Pete was about seven. Him um, and his his dad and his mother kind of did this Machiavellian thing where they actually intentionally um, pushed Pete, Pistol Pete away from the actual game of basketball. And this was done, uh, and it's, it seems so sadistic now, thinking about it, um, and, and more worse because of how methodical it was, but essentially what they would do is, and it was mainly his dad, I guess, but Press would go play outside and have a blast, knowing that Pistol was watching throughout the window as a little kid. So you remember we're talking about six or five. And um, every time that Pete would go out and talk to, like, say, hey, can I play to his dad? He would say, no, you're too small and send him back inside. And from an interview, this was even to the point of sometimes uh, Pistol Pete would have tears in his eyes 
um, cause it's just being a little kid and wanting to play and everything like that. But one day, um, his mom encouraged him to do it again. And at this point, uh, Pistol Pete was kind of just peering. And remember, now we're talking about a little seven year old kid or so, or six and a half year old kid, um, just peering around the corner. And then his dad calls him about and said, Hey, okay. So if you're going to play, I'm going to teach you how to shoot properly. And then that's kind of exactly where it started. So this Machiavellian thing of being held back and doing a little bit of uh, research on reverse psychology, a lot of the times it's really popular, or I guess not popular, but um, it's frequent that you find it in physical manifestations as this one, as far as actually pushing somebody or holding them back from something. And there's um, you know, a lot of the times you hear, you think of reverse psychology as saying something to get somebody to do something. Um, and this one, or think something. And in this case, I think it was kind of, um, very similar in the same sense of pushing pistol Pete away from the game of basketball made him more obsessed with it. And this is kind of a long-term play. And one thing that I did not mention earlier is that Press Maravich, Pete's dad, was a professional basketball player, um, loved the game, and, you know, wasn't as, like, extraordinarily successful. And it might be because at the time, you know, around the 1940s, 30s, and so uh, there wasn't as much infrastructure to the game to actually support somebody like with a long-term career and things of that nature. But what we ended up seeing is that um, press kind of groomed and manipulated Pete and exploited him in, you know, as we've seen in that last example to kind of become this basketball automaton. And then further on after that experience, press also sat Pete down and let him know that, the only way that he was going to be able to go to school was if he got a scholarship. And then, you know, through that, at the age of seven, he also was telling him at the, you know, sat him down at the same time and said, hey, you know, if you get really good at basketball, you might be able to uh, get your school paid for. Um, you know, at the time, Press was a coach and he earned hardly anything to be able to get Pete and his brother Ronnie to any sort of school. So it was, you know, sports was the only option for them. And, um, also, you know, press put it in Pete's head that, uh, you know, he might have the opportunity to play professionally and then earn a million dollars, uh, which was huge. And, you know, you could think at the time this was still, you know, 1940s, maybe early fifties that this is happening. And he is, you know, talking about a million dollars that's a lot in that day so anyway this is when kind of the uh, basketball android as a pistol pete calls himself kind of proliferated and uh, as a kid he practiced for six to ten hours a day um and that's that's extraordinarily as a kid extraordinary as a kid and like i remember playing basketball as you know if you've listened to other podcasts even you know if you're a true and try hard fan of the kind of the show when it was off the top podcast, Julian and I did talk about our basketball experiences slightly and talk, we've talked about basketball before, but, um, you know, I've seen hard workers and stuff like that, but nothing to that level. Um, and it showed, I mean, Pistol Pete, uh, you know, to his own self admission, uh, when he was an adult, uh, he was talking about how he loved, you know, basketball was more meaningful than the love of his parents or, you know, he would choose basketball over, you know, his parents, um, as his mom or after his mom would tuck him in at night after she said he loved him or she loved him, he would, uh, just kind of follow through, shoot the basketball and all he would think about as this is happening. Could you imagine is fingertip control backspin follow through? And which is kind of the sequence of steps that you want to go through the checklist of actual proper shooting form from the wrist up. And um, this kid was just, uh, you know, a prodigy. And I think that, you know, took to duck, took to it like a duck to water. And obviously with the encouragement of press and uh, the guidance of, uh, you know, 
drills and techniques and things, but Pete really kind of um, did it on his own a lot of the sense too, because, you know, there was times where it'd be storming and Pete would sneak out of his room to go play basketball in the middle of the night. Um, there is a rumor that he also um, would like go into the woods and sleep with his basketball. Um, I'm, I couldn't find very many things that could uh, corroborate that story, but um, you know, to his own self-admission, he would dribble the basketball, sit in the backseat of the car as his dad drove, and he would dribble the basketball um, while the car is moving. So, um, you know, he did this in movie theaters and everywhere. He just took a basketball everywhere he went. Um, so much to the point that he was quite skilled as a as a young kid. In, in eighth grade, he used to practice with the varsity team of the college, or not, I apologize, high school um, that he was, uh, involved with and, uh, of the area. And at this point you could tell that Pistol was, you know, just extraordinary to the game. And granted, he didn't have a lot of, you know, I think at the time when he was in eighth grade, he was about five, two and probably 90 pounds soaking wet. So very, very uninspiring of a future for Pete at the point of, um, you know, being young, but obviously super skilled being that he was, you know, hanging with varsity kids when he was, what is eighth grade, maybe 14, 13, he was playing with 18 year olds, uh, which is an extraordinary leap, of course, you know, in physical stature and maturity and time of developing in the game and things of that nature. Um, and eventually he actually started playing for the high school and um there was not a lot of success there at first being that it was slow to ex- they were slow to accept him um but at the time that when he moved to North Carolina um as his dad got a coaching job at NC State the um you know Pete kind of slowly became to come into his own he was still a lot younger but um, and still really scrawny at six feet tall and 130 pounds or so. But eventually he became obviously a prolific scorer, and that's kind of where um, you know his nickname Pistol came through. And uh, the reason that it was named that is because um, he would. I mean, I was watching a video, and um, one of the guys was talking about how Pistol Pete would like practice, 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 and one of his things he used to do is actually uh shoot from the hip um from half court uh understandably so being that he was so scrawny he didn't have the strength to actually have proper technique um and things of that nature and it's hard to shoot that far out anyway with proper technique you have to be strong um regardless but um that's kind of where his name pistol came through and um you know he he obviously tore it up in the game um And then eventually when he went to college, uh, I guess a little bit before then, he, you know, talking about how Pistol Pete only cared about basketball, uh, you know, that obviously was a detriment to his schooling and things of that nature. And so he didn't have uh, very good grades. So the colleges that kind of uh, whittled him down. Another thing that was parlayed around this time was uh, his dad was actually looking to coach Pete in college or maybe parlaying for his own college coaching career and said, Hey, uh, whoever wants pistol Pete's going to have to hire me on as a coach. And so uh, this is what kind of, uh, conspired or transpired in the fact of, um, NC state, which his dad was coaching at, at the time. Um, Pete didn't have the grades to get there. So eventually LSU brought both of them on and, um, that's how we have the greatest scorer in in college history um, with Pistol Pete going to LSU. And, you know, at the time, I think the things that need to be laid out, and I mentioned them before a little bit, but it's still important to revise them when it comes to the conversation of, you know, greatest college scorer of all time, which has been a lot. But um, what we have here is, you know, at the time, there was only freshmen weren't allowed to play um, varsity, and I'm putting those in quotations, uh, college sports. And the uh, change to the NCAA rules was in 1968 when they consolidated. There was a junior varsity and a varsity team, and um, those were just one. So, 
now freshman, you know, you could have a four year college career. Pete didn't have that. And he also didn't have the he also didn't have the actual three point line. And one of those things that uh was just extraordinary is that Pistol Pete averaged his average was forty four point two points per game. Over three years, no three point line. And one of those kind of like, what? That's first off, that's insane. Secondly, um, also there was an interview with Bill Russell. Or, sorry, I apologize. Bill Walton. And he was talking about how, because he played with Pistol Pete at the tail end of his career, and or played against him. And um, he was saying that the, a gentleman actually recorded or sat through and watched all of the games or the box scores of, you know, Pistol Pete. Uh, shoots makes a 22 footer and things of that nature and at the time um you know college the three point line was a little shorter than it is now but apparently pistol pete averaged about 13 threes per game um and so you can imagine 13 points to that average total uh pistol pete in today's day and age would have been scoring 57 points a game which is ridiculous um you know, it all was an accolades and success. Of course, Pistol Pete had a, an amazing career. He also did a lot of other things. Um, I think he averaged about, um, you know, probably like, you know, mids. I think uh, he didn't average 10 assists per game, but he he had a, he had a really solid assist total. Um, for a career, he had 425, and then in a season, he had 192 which is, um, it, it's amazing to think about being that I think his uh, career total games for those three seasons was 83. So basically uh, an NBA season's worth of games, he, you know, he collected that many, you know, that total of points of 3,667 and things of that nature. But no, no more fawning over Pete. Uh, cause I could do it a lot. I apologize. I, I know I said that I was, um, outwardly spoken, of a spoken, a big fan of pistol Pete, but, um, at the same time, I think you kind of see the actual real big negative, uh, effects of kind of the pressure and the single-minded pursuit of basketball for pistol. He, you know, had a lot of trouble with alcohol. I mean, you know, that's, that's not saying a lot to a college student, but, um, to the point of, you know, um, just craziness and wildness that he was going through at the time. Um, you could tell that it was slowly absolving his life. And this is something that, um, is hereditary that his mom struggled with as well was alcoholism. Um, and it just got worse for pistol as well as he eventually, when he got drafted, um, he had one of the, he was offered the first million dollar contract or one of the first at the time. And, um, you know, I think this is kind of where Pistol Pete uh, a little struggled a bit. And um, I think the reason why was a couple of reasons. So he, he, you know, had to kind of absolve himself into a game that is a little, quite a bit different than the, you know, the game that he was used to in LSU where, you know, he was the man um, of men. And not only at LSU, but in the college scene, but also, you know, he had to, um, you know, he was a little bit safer. He didn't stand around people, but he like, you know, got away with anything he wanted to. But, um, you know, at first, Pistol Pete didn't really have that great of a career at the Atlanta Hawks. Um, I think it really, of course, like, you know, he did well, but I think he started around the time of when he got drafted or traded to... Um, you know, the Utah or New Orleans jazz at the times when, you know, his career really took off and, um, he, you know, some of the notable games, he had a 68 point game against the Knicks. Um, the dude was just kind of just, you know, an extraordinary and prolific scorer, but he also had obviously the, the amazing court vision, the ball handling skills. And one thing that I remember that I pulled from pistol Pete's game that, uh, Never had the balls of actually implementing in a game, but um, 
definitely oh, of a game that somebody was coached, but I remember I was playing like the City League game years ago, and I remember rem- like watching a video of Pistol Pete actually shooting a ball without facing the hoop and like making it. Um, and it was kind of like a bank shot and things of that nature, but I thought it was extraordinary. Like he did it from the block and, um, that's a move that I pulled. And of course anybody, like people were in shock and stuff, but it is, a, uh, it shows like how amazing the, the, you know, how in sync he was with the game where, uh, you can, you can tell where you are on the court, um, in relation to the hoop, just by like where you're standing and what you can see. So there wasn't even, you didn't need sight or anything of that nature to know exactly where the hoop was and exactly how to score. And so it's just amazing to kind of, you know, think about this guy in that type of way. But anyway, um, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he still struggled a lot with uh, a few things. And I think addiction was one of them that he still was fighting in the NBA as well, especially around the time, um, you know, the, the NBA... Uh, I think it's, it's definitely way different now, but even, even in the time that Jordan was playing, um, there was a lot of like cocaine abuse, alcohol abuse and other things going on. Um, and I think the same probably happened around Pistol Pete's time as well. And, um, you know, when he went to Boston, that's super cool that he got to play with Larry Bird. And I think that he actually showed a lot more of his defensive game as well, because he was a, you know, he um he really made an effort on the defensive end and was a really strong team player and kind of switched himself up from that just kind of insane score that he was at the beginning of the career his career and then obviously in college as well and you know i could lament about pistol pete's you know like college career and basketball career for a long long time but i'll i'll save it and um so eventually he retires in um 1980 and um i think at this point you know pistol piece probably thought of retiring maybe like four or five times and i think at the very beginning of his career uh, at atlanta he was really not feeling it and this is a guy who's filled up the stat sheet with basketball accolades whether it be first team all nbas all-star games uh, second team all NBAs, all rookie team, scoring champion, of course, and he has his number retired uh, in three of the four stops of his career. The only one place is not Boston. Um, obviously, NBA Hall of Famer, uh, College Player of the Year multiple times, first team All American, SE, uh, SEC Player of the Year every single time that he stepped on the court for those three years scoring leader for those three years as well his name's like you know it's i'm i'm getting kind of getting tired of reading the accolades because of how prolific they are but um i think that you know pete really struggled uh at the time when um you know throughout his college career and i think that um and that started to wane on him a bit uh throughout you know everything going on from his you know wanting to quit feeling despondent from basketball and things of that nature but i i really think that um you know when life after basketball for pistol pete maravich is when kind of you see a lot of growth and you see somebody who uh you know perfect perfect example of somebody who um you know finds a huge hole in their life, uh, you know, at the tail end or after the single-minded pursuit of something so great and they've gotten so deep and they've achieved so much and it, um, you know, it leaves them feeling empty in the end when they don't have it. And even, even when Pistol Pete had it, he, he felt empty, especially in the NBA. But, um, I think this is going to be a quite a bit different than actually, looking at Blaise Pascal because he was through and through, you know, you, you don't really need to, um, you know, retire math or philosophy in, in that nature, but, um, definitely he had his trials and, um, tough spots as well. But, you know, after the time that Pete retired, he went through an iterative process of trying to find things to 
kind of fulfill him again. And, you know, through, uh, you know, speeches, Pistol Pete acknowledged that, you know, he wanted to become a, an amazing dad. Um, and he wanted to commit himself to that, to try to fill the gap and, you know, props him for admitting this, but I feel like it'd be difficult too, but, uh, that didn't kind of fill the gap. He tried veganism, uh, vegetarianism, uh, Microbi- macrobiotics, uh, you know, nutrition, Hinduism, yoga, um, you know, a whole bunch of things to kind of, you know, fill that hole. And I, I think the only thing, um, you know, he, I think it's almost kind of like somebody who's sinking. And as someone's slowly drowning, they start grabbing onto things. And I know that sounds crazy. I think I got deep, way too deep, way too quick there. But um, I think that's what it is. And he's trying to f- grab onto something that'll pull him up or, you know, that give him the opportunity to pull himself up to the surface again. But everything isn't stable enough. And he starts floating down even further um, and getting more desperate. And, um, you know, I, I th- Pistol Pete was also a little bit, reclusive at the time and um you know especially at the very beginning of his uh retirement but um eventually uh pistol pete found christianity and um you know around this time he was also self-admitted he was thinking about uh committing suicide for a long time or about a year and um it was that at the end of his second year that he actually of retirement um, that he claims, and I put this in quotation be, quotations because I think it means different things to different people. But uh, Pistol Pete said he was saved um, and was com- contemplating or complin- contemplating suicide um, for at least a year uh, to his own admission, and uh, but eventually, um, you know, he says that he. He was talked to by God, and um, then he became an, uh, a Christian. And so about, there was, you know, this is when Pistol Pete kind of was a prolific cr- Christian, um, and he got others involved, I think press. Uh, he was actually started becoming quite religious, and him and Pete used to hang out a lot, especially, um, uh, you know, at older age an older age press, uh, you know, needed a little bit more attention. Um, and Pete just became kind of, you know, he found his purpose, which is amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it feels great to kind of, um, absolve himself from this life that I feel like he, um, he played a lot. And I think it's one of those things and maybe I'm just kind of characterizing this quite a little bit too much, but, um, one of my favorite movies is Whiplash, and in Whiplash, um, I I won't I won't ruin it for you guys, but essentially, um, the way that Pistol Pete talked about his dad in um, you know, at his uh, memorial, uh, it was all love and admiration, um, and I he actually wanted to highlight this because he mentioned that a lot of people that went up and spoke before him actually spoke about press before so the man you know a couple years um before uh you know the press that pistol saw as kind of a christian and everything and he quite he 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 admired him and he you know there's many times where he said that uh press was his hero and uh to kind of revisit the whiplash analogy i think that the drummer in it is actually kind of even though I think there is a disdain, um, there is a ultimate and unfounding respect for the actual teacher that pushed him so hard, and um, and there's a love for kind of the sacrifice because uh, as Frederick Nietzsche says, you know, be careful when you stare into the abyss because the abyss stares unto you. And, um, you know, it takes, it takes life away from both people to push somebody so hard to success. And, um, I think that is, uh, you know, quite clear. 
in um, you know, Pistol Pete's case as well, and uh, you know, obviously Pete Press's case, of course, too. Um, I think for you know, when you uh, going on, I think for the rest of Pistol Pete's life, which is uh, very short, unfortunately, because he did die at forty. Um, so one year after, one year after Press died, um, I think he, you know, I, I think if he was happy and things of that nature, he, um, in Pistol Pete died playing basketball and he died of a heart attack, um, at, you know, in the middle of the game. And, um, it was actually found that he was born with a left uh, a missing left coronary artery, and that's the vessel that supplies uh, blood to the muscle fibers of the heart, and uh, in the right coronary was like grossly enlarged. So Pistol Pete was born with a heart defect, and um, it was it it was crazy um, to think that somebody that amazing and prolific, um, you know was born with a, a defect such of that nature. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of issues and trouble with that, um, you know, with that family in a sense of, you know, Ronnie, I think turned out fine, Pete's brother, but obviously, like I said, he lost his mother and that was, uh, horribly to, um, she committed suicide from a self-inflicted gunshot. And, um, and obviously he went through a lot of tough times, but I th- I think that's what, you know, I think it takes something out of you to be, become great. I'm not sure that everyone's supposed to be great. And I especially, you know, I don't think everyone should pay the price of trying to be, but it, uh, it's not only a price that you pay, but it's the people around you that pay it as well. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, if you were to pull anything from this example, and I know this isn't kind of a normal punctuated, you know, we're ranking Pistol Pete on his, you know, empathy, integrity, collaboration, vision, and self-awareness and the X factor. But I think that um, Pete um, uh, obviously shows what you can do with discipline and, and extraordinary amounts of hard work. But um, it's obviously not, um, you know, it's not achievable to everybody. I mean, six to 10 hours a day as a kid, um, having that drive, having that, um, kind of mechanism. But I think honestly, I mean, tell me again, if I'm grasping at straws, uh, maybe listen to, you know, Blaise Pascal's episode two, but you know, I don't know to kind of, uh, to should be chasing something that was instilled in you at, when you were young. I, you know, I feel sorry for Pete, especially when he suffers, um, you know, trying to replace a hole that he was obviously missing as a kid, especially from college into, you know, his, uh, professional career. And then obviously it was most evident when he couldn't mask things with, you know, his amazing basketball skill. But, um, yeah, uh, still one of my most favorite players in the world, um, ever. And, you know, I think that he did an amazing service to the game that is still paying dividends to this day um, through the examples of hard work, like I said, through the ex- examples of skill, through the examples of being an artist uh, within the game and uh, always thinking outside the box. Um, and one of my favorite favorite stories of Pistol Pete is, um, well, I guess two. So one, um, you know, at one point, uh, I actually ran across somebody, an older gentleman that played against Pistol Pete, and he said that, um, you know, at the time when he was playing, he played for Oregon State, and LSU played Oregon State, and um, he said that um, Pistol Pete was so amazing to see that he would pull up from way deep and um, buy, actually, like, you know, the opposing team's bench, obviously, while shooting on that side of the court. But he would shoot the ball, sit down on the bench, get up, go and leave without looking, and uh, would just swish it, which is amazing. Um, And it shows kind of the arrogance and the godlike kind of uh, complex that you get from just being so amazing at the game, especially so young, too. 
Um, and then one other thing is, uh, Pistol Pete got called for a travel, um, in a game. And, um, I think the exact quote was, yeah, you, um, you can't call that a travel. You don't know what that was. You've never seen that before. And, um, I think that's just extraordinary. Um, you know, such a leader in the game that, uh, you know, you find, uh, that you fight the infrastructure of what you're actually playing with sometimes, but, uh, you know, I think a perfect example of somebody who, you know, from a scientist of just grinding six to 10 hours a day, and obviously we didn't get into his, um, training regiment at all, but, uh, you can imagine how scientific he was being with that stuff, being that he was so skilled, and then to become the artist that he is, obviously, with the behind the back passes and the, um, you know, the no looks um, and just the, you know, obviously not looking at the hoop. I, I've said enough to kind of cement this guy's, you know, maybe not enough to kind of pay homage to Pistol Pete and the way that he should be. And, you know, the legacy that he leaves is a legend, but um, enough for you guys to get the picture, I think. And so what you, can, what you can expect is obviously I'll be doing an episode on uh, Blaise Pascal for all you guys who are more math and philo- philosophy orientated. And um, then we can probably chew on a little bit more of uh, what it actually means to kind of like have that Machiavellian reverse psychology played on you as a kid. And hopefully I can find more examples, but I think the two are just amazing um, that I did find. But anyway... You know, thank you guys for listening through this one. Um, I really enjoyed kind of doing research and had a lot of the stuff already pre, uh, pre-downloaded, let's say, from uh, just kind of like, you know, doing research on my own as far as my own interests. But um, yeah, what you can expect is an episode on Blaise Pascal uh, coming in uh, two weeks from now. And uh, I hope you guys had a blast. It's been a blast for me. Um, you know, if you want to reach out in any way, say you enjoyed the episode, you didn't, or uh, anything in the like, please do. Um, you know, I really appreciate all the correspondence that we've gotten and get already. Um, and, you know, as as we do this thing, it's a, it's a journey that we're both going on. So I really appreciate it that you're, uh, that you're along for the ride. But anyway, uh, you know, Thanks once again. Reach out to us. Don't be strangers. And of course, peace.